Welcome to the Stronger Voices Podcast. I'm Melinda May. And I'm Trevor Knight. And this is episode one of season two of the Stronger Voices Podcast. Season two. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to be here today. Season two is special because we invited guests onto the podcast this season, starting with today. So our first guest is a fellow named Gray. Gray was actually the very first person that we reached out to about being on the podcast, and we didn't even think he was going to say yes. We discovered Gray and his music from Spotify's Discover Weekly playlist. In April of 2020, Gray's song called Swoon was put on my Discover Weekly playlist, and I loved it. And I started exploring the rest of his catalog, and I started following him on Spotify so I would be notified of his future releases. I can confirm that we listened to Gray on repeat many times while making dinner in 2020. So I became a huge fan of Gray starting then. I love his songwriting and his production. So when we started asking guests to be on the podcast, he was a natural ask for us. And I'm so excited that he gave us a yes. And I loved talking with him. Since our conversation with Gray, the three of us have actually become friends. We've been able to share unreleased songs back and forth and give each other some ideas and notes, and it's just been a huge blessing. Um, and this conversation with Gray was such an encouragement to us and such a blessing to us, and we think it's going to encourage you too. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us for the start of Season 2. We're so excited to be here once again with you guys, so here it is. Enjoy our conversation with Gray. Well, we are going to start with, um, I'm going to say a little bit about who uh, Trevor and I are. This way, we're just kind of more comfortable um, sure. talking to each other. And then I'm going to share a little bit um, from my heart about why we're doing this podcast. Um, so Trevor and I are both singer-songwriters. We live in Brooklyn. That's where we are right now. Um, Trevor grew up in Minnesota. I grew up in Pennsylvania. We've been together for about a year. Um, so Trevor... Uh, Went to school uh, at Dartmouth, studied economics, did rowing there, which was a big part of his life. Ended up working in finance in New York City, up and left his job after like much, much... Pre I'm sorry, I'm telling your story no, for you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Should have let you do this. No, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> and um, after like much, much prayer, um, he leaves his job and decides, I want to do this singer-songwriter thing full-time. This is all I want to focus on. This is all I want to do. I have a completely different story. I, well, I mean, I guess it's not completely different, but I started going to school at Penn State, left after a year, decided all I want to do is music. I moved to New York City with no money, no plan. I've been here. It was my nine year anniversary yesterday. Forgot to tell you that. Um, yesterday was nine years to the day that I've been here. Um, and so we're, we met in Brooklyn. Uh, we went to the same church. Well, uh, technically Manhattan, but in New York. Um, That's cool. Yeah. And so... As like singer songwriters, we do interviews and stuff too, like God willing, like I really appreciate anytime I got an opportunity to do one, but I noticed in interviews, there's like a, a lot of questions like, um, that are very similar, you know, like what comes first, the music or the lyrics, you know, nothing wrong with that question. And I'm like, you know, this isn't, I'm not throwing shade at anyone or anything, but I realize that God has done so much in my life and so much in my story and so much in Trevor's that I really... You'd like people to ask the right questions so Bingo. that you can talk about it. Bingo. Yeah. You know, I lived in like a Hasidic Jewish neighborhood for a year and I was essentially like followed kosher laws for like a year. Well, no one's ever going to think to ask me about that. Like, how do I tell that story? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. th there's just so many things like that. And so I wanted to use our podcast, which we've been doing for... Uh, over a year. Over Since a year. November 2019. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to turn it into a platform where we ask artists um, about the stories that they want to tell. And even if it is about what comes first, music or lyrics, like it doesn't matter. Just what, like, what is God doing in your life? Like, what, what are, what are some things you've overcome? So you get the gist, you know? So yeah. th that, this is that platform. So the conversation might get a little deep. Uh, don't run from it, but basically we just want to glorify God through our conversations and talk about the good stuff and like whatever God has on your heart, you know, like maybe you, you, um, you want to talk, like, I would love to tell the story of how like you and I, you know, got together and fell in love, but you know, whatever it is, maybe you want to tell the story about how, how you fell in love with your wife. Maybe you want to tell a story about, like you said, how you went through like a fitness transformation. Like, I don't care what it is. I just want to know like what is on your heart as someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So that's what this is. Yeah, and <laughs> and awesome. don't yeah, and don't be afraid to um like, like it doesn't have to be perfect. Like we can edit it. If there's something you don't want us to include, we'll just take it out yeah. and um yeah, you don't sure. ha- you don't have to be worried about whatever you say being passed on to all posterity or anything. So um cool. yeah, just f- nice and free and open and let's have a Sweet. nice let's have a nice discussion yeah. about <laughs> things that we like. Yeah. So I know That's like awesome. For myself, like I want to know um, kind of just a little bit about you and like where did you get started and how did you get into music and um, like where did this come from for, from as early as you want to go? Sure. Yeah. Um, drawn to music at a super young age. Also grew up in church. So like even as a little kid. So <laughs> I can go all the way back and say that when I was like a baby, I would like I had this specific Mozart song that I really liked, like a baby, really kind of scary actually. And this is when my parents knew they were in trouble. And I would like, I could hum that song like on key. And I was like, no, like I want you to play that one. Um, and my, my mom said I was like a year old or like a little less, like stupid, stupid young. (laughs) Um, and so, you know, they immediately got me into piano lessons when I was old enough to understand, which I think I started like around the age of seven um and then in that whole time too I was in church and um we like we used to go to kind of more traditional services so there was a choir director and stuff and I used to like stand up on the pews and like yeah like I was so (laughs) into it and so um I mean music's been a part of my life for as long as I can remember in that realm um but I think it really like I I started to write song I think I wrote my first song when I was seven like I was really kind of just engaged with it and mm-hmm. I would say, I would have told you, like, if you'd asked me at any point, um, as a young man, like, I would have said, that's what I'm going to do with my life. Wow. Like, I'm going to be full-time music, whatever, in some way, shape, or form. And it, and it did change forms, you know. At one point, I was like, I'm going to be on Broadway. And, like, I did all the things to chase that. Um, wow. Like, I had friends that were on Broadway. And, like, right before I moved away, for, I lived in New Jersey for a decade. So, like, right before I moved away, the, and you can... You can so um, the last thing I did before I moved was I was in like a regional production of Les Mis and it was a pretty big deal because they were like the only people who could get the rights to it and so like I met the Broadway cast of Les Mis and like had lots of conversations with them when it was still on and um wow. and I was I was Marius in that and like it was a and oh, every nice. single other person it was really fun and I'd get I grew my hair out it was like super huge and um every single That's other person so that played a lead in that role, like in that show, was like on TV or on Broadway or off Broadway, like within the year. And I just moved away and kind of fell off the map um, in a good way. And that's like, that's when I had met Grace, um, moved back to hometown, which is Fredericksburg, Virginia. And we started dating and um, yeah, it's funny cause it's not, it's not like Grace pulled me away from music at all, but I just, like music was my greatest desire and then my desires just like started to change a little bit as we got to know each other and so it was a lot more about like how like how do I build a life that's compatible with this other person because I really felt like we were supposed to be together and yeah I really felt God kind of like start to shift my heart from you know maybe like maybe music isn't your full-time thing like maybe you're not supposed to be a worship pastor maybe you're not supposed to um, be famous. <laughs> um, and so just like kind of a humbling started to take place in my heart where it's like, it doesn't matter how good you are. Like, it doesn't matter what opportunities have been handed to you. Um, like what actually matters is God's call on your life. And like the worst place to be is outside that. And so, yeah, so kind of the shift started to take place for me. And so now like music's not my full time thing. I work for a healthcare company and write songs on the weekends, and it's great. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more there, but that's kind of the that's kind of the gist of, I think, my journey in music um, overall. Um, was there a time that you thought that you were going to be like a worship pastor? You desired to be a worship pastor? For sure, for sure. And I think I actually think that a lot of people desire that. I think a lot of musicians that grew up in the church desire that um, because it, because I think it's set up like this pinnacle thing. And so, yeah, like I don't want to be – I'm not a cynic. I'm actually like removed far enough away from it because I've had some struggles with like I had a staff role in the church for a year. It was a really tough time for me. Um, and so 
yeah, lots of like big picture thoughts there, but I haven't talked about any of it because I think there are so many like hurt Christians that are just like putting out mm. that cynicism in the world. And so I wanted to like wait to like feel healed from that stuff. But um, I, yeah, I think that the churches we go to and even just like Christianity in our country, like in our nation, in um, North American Christianity, you know, I think that we set up like worship pastor as like this pinnacle thing that people should chase um and then like but like being a missionary is like off to the fringe like you have to feel the specific call to do that and i i like really wrestled with that because i didn't like i couldn't find very many examples of worship pastors in scripture but there are so many examples of missionaries and i'm like how does this fall wow. within the great commission like i, I just mm. don't get i just don't get that um like if music is a means to an end and the end is sharing jesus with somebody then I'm all about it. But like, if it's just like, we can't all just pick up guitars to encourage the body every Sunday and say that like, that is like that just checking that box is doing everything that God's calling us to do. Cause I just don't think it is. Um, mm -hmm. Still, I know that's like really aggressive thing to say, but I don't think I, so at I all. Think, I, th I think it's incredibly wise yeah. just to hear you say that, you know, you're calling or anyone's calling should be the focal point and not what their idea of success is or someone else's idea of success is or, you know, what you think you should want or any of those things. You know, maybe maybe your calling isn't exactly what you said, some glorious glitzy position at the top of some leadership structure. You know, maybe God has a different thing for you, and I think that's wise to think that way. It's, an, it's encouraging to hear you say that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, and, and that's funny because it does change, right? So, like, you were in finance, and now you're doing this. And it's like, I'd have a hard time believing that anything but, like, feeling that shift in your heart would cause that, you know? Because I know guys in finance, like, you can do really well for yourself doing that. So it's obviously not about, like, accolades or whatever for you. I'm going to brag about Trevor for a second. Yeah, he definitely doesn't care about <laughs> that stuff at all, which I love about you. But I also loved how how you mentioned, like, um, you said like God had to humble your heart. And I feel like that's a common pattern. That certainly God has humbled my heart many times in my life. And I pray that he continues to do that. Thank you, God. But I do think it's a common pattern. Like before you, um, I, I feel like before you kind of land on the thing that you are really, um, get joy from, or I don't want to use the term, the thing that you're supposed to be doing, um, that's not really what I mean, but before you land on the thing that you kind of get to sink your teeth into, there's this period of like being humbled. Um, yeah. did that, yeah. would you say that there was like a whole time frame of that humbling or was it kind of just like extremely like gradual? It, it was great. Both. And, and it still okay. happens. Um, uh, yeah. And by the way, I think the reason that is, is that God is much less concerned with you doing the things like with you doing the things he wants you to do and much more concerned with you being the person that he wants you to be. And so I think like, that's why we see these like shifts in character that then drive actions and not the other way around because like, Bingo. God doesn't need you. Like God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Like that's he doesn't, so wise. Like, so he, he just doesn't like, he doesn't need you. And in fact, like I find that he uses me, like he's used me so much more in like the coffee shop or talking to the stranger or the homeless person or um, like going to, going to a different country and inter interacting with the hurting. Like he's used me so much more in just one-offs than he ever used me like when I was in a paid position in a church. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It no, just no, no, definitely no. Right. steered me. Yeah. So. And I'm so affirmed too because I truly believe that part of – like the joys of my life have been like working in different restaurants in New York, trying to make it as a singer songwriter all the while. But like, that's been a vehicle for ministry for me. And, um, like, I'm so thankful for that, but that would be so hard to like explain to someone who thinks in a kind of like a churchianity box, you know, like, it's like, no, I went into these like really dark bars <laughs> and I worked there and like, and you told people about Jesus, you know, yeah. And you didn't have to work for a church to do that. That I think is yeah. that what you're getting at kind of? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that yeah, I just would say that in like in that realm, that's why it's like such an amazing personal thing because I think that 
uh, like there are just things in life that have gravitational pulls and like the, the gravitational pull of the Holy Spirit on your heart has to be like really strong. Like the stronger that is, the darker the places you can go. And so wow. like I'm not going to judge like somebody else who like needs churchianity to practice how to reach mm-hmm. a hurting world. Wow. But if it never shifts from like a train, if that never is just a training ground, like if that's the end all be all, then I don't want any part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like it's got to be a training ground. Like it's got to propel you to something different, you know? And I know that better than anyone because I went to like Grace and I went to Christian school. Um, She went to Christian private school all throughout life. I was homeschooled when I was young. I think that they were just incredible training grounds for us that God then used to propel us out into the world. But I think, I think we get, I think there's a much greater temptation to like complacency and passivity than there is to, um, stepping too far. Like, I don't think you can go too far for the sake of the gospel. So, and I don't, and I don't find that most people struggle with that either. Like how far is too far? Most people struggle with like, how close can I stay to comfort or like how close can I get to the line of like the life God wants me to live and living like the world? Like how close Mm. can I get to the line? Wow. Um, that's something I've seen a lot. Um, yeah. So how did you get to that point where you are thinking basically from almost from birth, like what I'm going to do is this, I'm going to do this full time music thing and I'm even going to be like on Broadway. And then you go through this period where I, what I'm hearing happen is I just fell so in love with this person that I was like, how do I make this work? Because now I want my life to be with her and through that falling in love, I'm putting words in your mouth, but um, oh, yeah. through that falling in love, like it sounds like that's kind of how, um, I guess in your own words, like God had sort of like humbled you about music. How did you land back on creating music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one, I would say like that definitely happened like the humbling of my heart because I wanted to be with grace that definitely was but I would also say like that was a driver and that's what I keep trying to get at like that was a driver to a bigger spiritual reality which is that like I was choosing like I was choosing my destiny based on where my talents were instead of like trying to change to be like to just do whatever God wants you know so like yeah. the way that I approached like and I want to be super clear on that because the way that I approached music like you know what's so funny about the disciples like none of them pursued fishing careers after they accepted Jesus like in their hearts yeah. and so like it's but they were all fishermen before that right or most of them were and so and I'm not saying that like Christ always calls you to leave your trade but I just think that's like the kind of cataclysmic event that was happening in my life and God just used kind of grace to grace my wife. It's kind of confusing, but both and, um, (laughs) to make that shift. Um, but then how did I land on still creating music? Then once, uh, once all the other priorities in my life were in order and I started to leave space, like for the Lord to call me to do what he wanted me to do, then some of like, then I was allowed to like, have auxiliary priorities that were compatible with the core of who I'm supposed to be and like whatever Mm -hmm. the Lord wants. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah. So like even in college, like I was on, I was on Liberty's worship team all through college. And that was like a really great experience at times. It was really hard experience at times, but that paid for most of my school. Um, you got like tuition reimbursement, like partial or full, like you could kind of work your way up too. So like music was still a part of my life and, and some would even say that that was like professional at that time, but it wasn't like this all consuming drive anymore. It was just an, one of those auxiliary things that kind of shifted into place. Um, and then, then like how I ended up creating music in the capacity that I do now is right before I went to college, um, I still had the desire to try to record an album and put something out. I just, didn't think I was going to pursue music full time, but I still felt like the calling from like the calling or the desire, whatever you want to call it. Um, I know that they're distinct, but sometimes they're more similar than we would think. Um, I still had this deep desire to record an album before I went to college. I was like, I'm going to do this. 
And so I went to Atlanta and recorded an album and yada, yada, yada. Long story short, like it ended up basically, it wasn't like a scam, but the guy who did it totally dropped the ball and I never got any of my stuff back that I paid into, but I didn't no. pay enough. Yeah, but I didn't no pay way. enough for it. Like I didn't pay enough for it to go chase it down. Yeah, and that was another moment of, well, obviously God didn't want me to put in an album then, <laughs> you know? So, cause like, otherwise that probably would have gone swimmingly and everything would have been fine. So then I decided I just would put out a song when I got to college. And so that's, I wrote October when, like I just wrote it because a bunch of my family members were dying and it was making me process like these deep seated, like why is death sad? And why is life happy? And like, where do I find happiness in the moments and like how does eternal joy carry through all that and so just like these big picture things so I sat down and wrote that song and I was like I want to put this out I think it would be a great message for the world to hear and that was kind of even a shift there right like not I'm going to put this out and be famous or super popular or whatever I just was like this feels like something this feels like a message that's worth saying Mm -hmm. so I put it out um and then something crazy happened because I don't know what, like, I really don't know what, but somehow, like, the algorithms smiled upon me, and all of a sudden, like, it just was streaming, like, a lot. And, like, I would walk around my college campus, and people would be streaming it, like, on the on the TVs, like, in the library study rooms. And I was, like, like, nobody knew who I was. And, like, this happened, like, overnight. And I was, like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. And that's that's when like through doing that that's when I kind of figured out I started to figure out I think the groundwork was being laid for I can put out songs like in a digital world I can put out songs that are based on the message and just let the Lord decide who they reach and like it's all good like I don't have to are you guys still there uh yeah you're frozen frozen but but your audio didn't skip once Okay, so Sweet. that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so it was like, okay, way. I can do this without like going on the road. Like, I don't have to do music the world's way. I can just put it out because I believe in the message, and then mm-hmm. let the cards fall, you know, or the chips yes. fall, whatever the reference is. So that's yeah, that's kind of how. And then after that, I just did music at like whatever capacity I could manage and still steward the rest of my life well. Um, yeah, I think I just want to like make a quick, like, uh, not a recap, but just to point out that pattern of like when you're making, I think, anything in life, but when you're making music an idol, because this happened to me as well, where I think I was making my career in music an idol. Mm-hmm. And I went home and I was like, when I, when God convicted my heart of this, I like, was just totally broken and I went home and I told my parents like I know I moved to New York City to do music but I'm not doing it anymore like I can't even look at this like forget it whatever and uh there's something that happens when you put down that music as an idol and put down like wanting to be famous and put down all that stuff and as you noted just released your song because you're like no like I I think that this is a good message or like I just believe in this Mm -hmm. and something clicks in that moment and like um I think everything kind of like looks different after that. And I think you're experiencing like the freedom of, well, I don't really, I don't really care about this, this stuff or like, um, monetary success necessarily. Um, not necessarily like demonizing that, but do you know what I'm getting at here? Yeah. God like redefines what success is to you even, right? you know, like what does success look like? And you know, is music the end all be all or is the gospel? Because if mm-hmm. music's the end all be all versus the gospel being the end all be all, my life's gonna look radically different. I'm gonna make a lot of decisions different. And so, like, why, if music's something I'm resistant to submitting to the Lord and the calling of my life, then it is an idol, right? Like, anything that I love it when it's explained to me that way. And it was a bunch of times as a kid that, like, imagine like God reaches for everything in your life right now. Like, what's the thing that you close your fist around? Well, like, I whatever that, that is. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like yeah. whatever that is, that's what you need to work on. Yeah, it's it's so. it, like that fisherman's analogy is it's really potent. I'd never heard that before, but you hear people all the time like you know, your calling is this job and you know, God's using this job and you to do his will. But it it's interesting that that didn't happen for the disciples. Like they you yeah. know, they they gave their lives to 
spreading the gospel and just spreading the gospel. I mean, they could have said, well, God's going to use me to be a fisherman and continue to be his worker as I'm a fisherman, but that didn't happen. And I mean, I think I, I think I believe that people can still do that. They can, you know, work whatever occupation they are yeah. passionate about and God can use that. But yes, that's a really like salient example that you brought up that after they learned the truth of the gospel, they didn't have the desire to put fishing first anymore. You know, they had that's the desire, the key, right? Yeah, they had the desire to spread the good news. Right. Yeah, that's the key. Because if God had said, I want you to share the gospel through being a fisherman, they still would have done it. Right. It's just that fishing wasn't the desire anymore. So, like, I want to be clear with that too, right? Because now we're in, a, like, it's in a little bit of a different world now. Like, most of the world has heard of Jesus but never experienced him. And so I think, like, the way that we interact with that changes. I actually, I think that the church overcorrected for a while and uh, what's the word? Like basically like made what I said dogmatic. Like you need to just put everyone just put down your careers and do full-time ministry. But it's like, well, full-time ministry doesn't look the way that it did for them either. So it's kind of perplexing. Um, right. It's like very perplexing actually. I do think that the Lord can use us wherever we are. I think sometimes he calls us to specific careers. I think sometimes he uses the careers we're in like my dad-in-law uses his career to like share the gospel all the time with people. Um, so I think, I think that's cool. I think the key is just having the humility to say, Lord, what do you want? Like here I am, send me whatever that is, you know? Yeah. Right. That's, yeah, it, that's the key. The, instead of being like, Lord, I'm going to go work in finance. Please use working in finance to, you know, yeah. fulfill your will. It, yep. The reverse of that is much more powerful and much more true to what I think God wants is God use me in whatever capacity you want. And if that leads me to work in finance, it leads me to work in finance. But yeah. um, not putting my will or my desires ahead of God's. I think yeah. that's I think that's what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that's the posture that Jesus has, too. Right. Like even to the point of like we we're thinking about this with Easter. Right. Like even to the point of death, like, Lord, would you take this cup from me? But not my will, but your will be right. done. Yeah. That is like the pinnacle of like a non-sinful. Like his desire is not even sinful. If it was, then his sacrifice was meaningless. Like the desire to have the cup taken away was just a human desire. Like knowing mm, he was wow. going to be crucified. It wasn't even a sinful one. Like if right. it is, we're in trouble. But that clash of like my will versus God's will is huge. And I think sometimes we hyper-focus on like let me check all the Christian boxes and make sure that I'm not – like that my desires aren't sinful, but we forget that like a desire doesn't have to be sinful to get in the way of what the Lord wants you to do. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's just that once you know that it is in the way, it's a sin to hang on to that. You wow. know? Yeah. Yep. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. That, that is so encouraging. That is so encouraging mm -hmm. the way that you, how clearly you put that. Yes. That, that is such a good way to think about it. Yeah. The, I think the idea that, that kind of leads to the idea that it, it doesn't have to be a bad thing to get in the way or it doesn't have to be a bad thing to be an idol. You know, your mm -hmm. your partner can turn into an idol. Your mm -hmm. your kids can turn into an idol. You, watching yeah. football on Sundays can turn into an idol if you, you know, consistently put those things on a pedestal above where you put God yeah. in your heart. Yeah. I don't remember who it is that says it. It might be like Kyle Eidelman, but I think – he says, like, whenever a good thing becomes a God thing, that's an idol. Mm. And, like, that's a really just kind of a simple metric. Whenever um, a good thing becomes a what thing? Sorry. A God thing. A God thing. When a like, good thing what becomes what a God thing. That? Like, when you, not a God thing, like, the sense we'd say, oh, wow, like, you know, I almost got in this car accident and lived a God thing. A God thing meaning, like, you take something that's on the pedestal of good and you elevate it to the pedestal of God. Gotcha. Like, in your life. I um, see. But just kind of capitalizing on what, what Trevor's saying here, that it doesn't have to be a bad thing to get in the way. Um, right. In fact, a lot of biblical scholars would define idolatry as even just a good thing that gets in the way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, so do you guys want to move into talking a little bit about specifics about Gray's music? I would love that. I know Trevor wants to. <laughs> yeah, now that you guys have gotten like the, the TED Talk sermon, you guys are getting the, you we guys are, whether first. it's a benefit, I was going to say whether it's a benefit or a drawback, you're getting the, 
the results of the fact that like I've mostly just been at home for nine months. So I've had a lot to think about. Um, It's so I'm already so encouraged and I just can't wait to put this out there. (laughs) It's like such good stuff. Gray. Like, thank you. Wow. Um, Melinda's great at that. Just like get into the deep, real stuff real fast. (laughs) When we it's were getting stuff. to know each other, Melinda just asked me all sorts of things I had never thought about, and <laughs> like I had, <laughs> like we became like super good friends very quickly just because we would have these multi-hour conversations yes. where, yeah. you know, it would get deep real fast, and yeah, that's yeah. how we fell in love. Thanks for putting up with me. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, cool. Go ahead, yeah, Jeff. You, you can ask Gray um, a, a few questions. Gray, sure. I love your music, Gray. Like I <sighs> love it. I've listened to Swoon like so many times. I've like oh. I love Good Night. Um, Those are probably my two favorites. Yeah, but I w- I have to admit, like Trevor, legit, like knows your whole collection. Can tell you <laughs> like <laughs> so, instruments you use on each song. So I. I got Swoon dropped on my Discover Weekly in March of last year. And in March of last year, we were living in New York and we had been together for about a month and everything, you know, went bonkers and we had to leave the city. So we drove back to where I'm from, to Minnesota, and, you know, lived in an Airbnb together for three months. Um, And it was like a very defining time, I think, in in a lot of people's lives but certainly in ours um but we wrote a lot of good songs during that time and we y- you know we got to explore where i was from during that time and hang out with my family and we listened to a ton of music during that time and so i like swoon popped on my discover weekly in march of 2020 and i just dove right in i loved it i loved the production i loved the vocal <laughs> on it i loved the songwriting um, and since then I've kind of been a fan, um, <laughs> of everything fan. you've, you've put out. Um, so yeah, I, I have a couple questions about, um, your collection and your methods and stuff. I would have guessed before you, you, uh, mentioned how you grew up and that you took piano lessons. I would have guessed that you were a piano person first just by like oh listening wow. to your songs and like yeah. the presence of the electric piano on a lot of your songs. I love electric piano. I'm definitely one of those Dude. people who's like, you know what would be a good texture in this? Electric piano. Or like, Just how give can me the we Rhodes. F- give me the yeah. Whirly. Yeah. Yeah. All how day. Can, <laughs> yeah. How can we how can we fit a piano into this song somehow? Um yeah. I'm I'm that way for sure, but um so I would have guessed that you were like a piano player just by listening to your songs cuz I love the tones you use and the and the voicings you use and um but I I guess the the first question I would ask about how you make your music and how you produce it um you use a lot of live instruments and you do it really well and really gracefully. Do you do you do a lot of those yourself? Do you have friends, you know, that come into the studio with you and it's more of a creative process where you're like, here's the melody, here's the lyrics, let's create a song. Or do you write all the parts yourself and then you go into the studio and just track them? Um, yeah, how and are they come the s- together? Yeah, are they the same people every time or you just hire people every time to play your instruments? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, first of all, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I care a lot about voicings, but I don't think a lot about them because when you're doing your own music, you just get to play whatever sounds good to you. So yeah. it's nice to know that, that sounds good to you that you notice that. Um, when it comes to the live instruments, yeah, I've been very fortunate that I have a lot of friends that are very talented musicians. And so when when everything happened with October, I had, yeah, I had buddies in school that were very good at music and I kind of got to choose my own adventure story. <laughs> and so I did a lot, I did a lot of pre-production for the album. Like I knew what the chords were. I knew what, cause you kind of have to assemble the song before you're going to start tracking anything. Um, but with this album, like I knew what I wanted a lot of the lead lines to be other ones. I didn't as much, but what I did is, you know, I grabbed my buddy James that I've known since high school. We both ended up going to Liberty. Um, so he was there and we started to kind of work our way through the songs in studio. So we did drums first and then layered. The pre-production was there, so like pianos and stuff like that. And then we layered drums and then everything else kind of in order. Usually drums, bass, and then guitars and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. And then like filling things in with pads and textures and post-production, whatever. But the other thing that was happening is I, when October blew up, I was able to... Um, 
play a couple of shows. And so mm-hmm. I kind of got to like rotate people in and out of like my first show was like a drummer and like one guy on guitar and then me <laughs> playing acoustic and singing. And it was great. I laughed like it wasn't terrible, but it just wasn't anywhere near like by the time I left school um, and then finished my master's, I had played concerts pretty regularly. And like the last concert we did when the album came out, there were like two acoustic guitars, two electric guitars, a bassist, um, somebody playing like a bassist with a Moog and a bass <laughs> and a keyboard and a drummer and then like three background vocals. That sounds awesome. Wow. That, that sounds, sounds like so much fun. So it was super full. I have to text you guys a video because um, I, I do have like some cell phone videos from that. So, I mean, it kind of grew that way too. And I was learning. I knew a, I knew nothing. I knew a lot about how to be a songwriter, a little bit about how to be an artist, and almost nothing about how to be a producer. So I had lots of moments that. And and so the other thing that happened is I met a guy um, at my church, and we ended up really hitting it off. And uh, the big me dragging my heels to putting out anything was that I didn't know anybody who was capable of like engineering a record. Mm. Yep. that I would have wanted to put out and I had already been burned by like going to studio and doing like the low right. budget recording thing and mm-hmm. so that was like a big I pressed pause on that so my friend Tanner is like instrumental in the way that ev- absolutely everything sounds um, and he's he's awesome he's really making it now um, in the world but that was like his first I think full length record that, that he did mm-hmm. and we did it together so there were so many moments of him like teaching me like bro this is how to be a producer like you're an idiot <laughs> and me just trying to like adjust uh and live live my life and and not screw up the album so does that kind of answer your question a little bit yeah definitely definitely so it's a bunch it, it, of different people i play like yeah. the keys and i can write the guitar lines but i've got friends that are so freaking talented at guitar that i'll just sit there and hum like what i'm hearing and then they can like just play it or sometimes they'll push back a little bit and find what fits. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I can do it in my brain. I just can't like translate everything to my hands always. And there's other people. It's like, if you're a drummer and that's your thing, like, let me let you do your thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I contracted all my friends for the album, basically. I, cause that's where like the business side of me came in. I was like, I don't want to screw over my buddies and have like people involved in this that aren't getting anything out of it. So I basically said, Hey guys, I'm doing this thing. October was really successful. You've played concerts with me slash I've known you forever slash like I love you and you're my friend. Please sign this contract for X percent of like whatever the album makes, you're going to get X percent of it for like a year or up to a certain dollar amount, like which would they were like substantial. Like I wasn't yeah, I wasn't cheaping anybody out. Um, like some of the caps were like thousands of bucks, um, but I just didn't know. Like you don't know how successful it was going to be. Right, I didn't right. have several grand to just like lay on the table and say yep. let's yep. make this thing um and so yeah it so was instead like of my, paying them oh wait sorry you go first no it's fine it's like my internal it's like a, it versus doing crowdsourcing or something like that which i'm not against but i just didn't want to do it um that was like my way of solving the problem of let me make sure my buddies get paid that sounds and so like smart. you'll make what i make yeah <laughs> it's not that smart it's, it's just well, that we I've were never all thought of it. i've never thought of that and you know i think a lot of independent musicians run into that exact problem and uh, and some of yeah. those experiences you mentioned are just par for the course they're universal when you're learning how to make music you know you do it with the yes. people around you that you know because you don't yes. have thousands of dollars laying around to to hire someone you've never met who's really good at producing records to produce your record um yes. unless you do have thousands of dollars and then even in that case you know, you don't have a relationship with that How person. How do you find people and, you and trust? Th- that person doesn't know your, your tone or your vibe or mm-hmm. your style. Yeah. Um, so, like, some of those things that you mentioned, um, you know, you, you try to find, s- like, the, the first few records I made, it was the, I knew, like, two people who could help me make the records, and they helped me make the records. <laughs> so yep. you, do with, you do with what you have, and you do mm-hmm. what you can, and yeah. I think that's, like, a universal experience. But For sure. that I- I think that is a really smart approach to you know getting people on board and making them feel like they're valued because they are valued um but not you know totally digging yourself a huge hole on the front end yeah that sounds yeah. wise to me yeah Where? i mean and you can split that up like you can say here's some money up front and then like mm-hmm. the rest on the back half um i think however you're doing it because i did that some like sometimes i would play shows and just give the money to like the people who played with me that were also doing mm-hmm. my album with me 
um, when I did shows that paid, which was not most of the time, but you get the idea. Yeah. So. Where'd you get that business savvy side, do you think? And you also oh said goodness. you did consulting, so I don't know if those two things are related. Um, yeah. But yeah. the idea that an artist is like, you know what, let me, I mean, Trevor's like this too, but um, the, the idea that an artist is like, well, let me write up this contract and make sure everybody gets paid, I feel like is um, rare. Yeah. It is. Yeah, that was a, one of the things that happened in the whole humbling period that we talked about was like, God, like, what do you want me to do very practically? So, like, I actually went to school for business. Um, so I have two bachelors in business and a master's in business. Um, ah, so there a lot of the business savvy came from that. Well, there um, it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't, know that I had a, I don't know that I had a ton of business savvy before that, but I was like, what can I dedicate myself to? to kind of round myself out. I've always been like very logical, very practical. Um, not like to my credit, but just like the way that I would think about things. Um, but at that side was really grown because I'm a very polarized person. I don't think you meet a lot of people who are like infinitely creative, but also like very regimented, logical. Like usually yeah. it's the, like you've got the emotions and feelings and um, like your friends that are just like hurricanes or like firecrackers or fireworks or whatever you want to call it. Like they just emote and it's like, then you've got people who are like sometimes maybe quieter, a lot more logical. Those are, these are extremes, but it sounds like the two no, of us. No, you're so right. And great. It's so funny. I tell Trevor this all the time. Like I tell him this, like my favorite part about Trevor is that he's, I tell him like, he's the everything man. Like he's the artist and he's creative and he's like, deep and like zany at times but so logical and also like can think things through well and I I tell him this all the time like that is a very rare thing because you usually have one or the other yes. um that's yeah. so funny Trevor's like yeah, that too no so wonder funny. you so, love his music so much so maybe we're meant to be best <laughs> friends like that might be <laughs> just the outcome of this call but okay, let it's me true ask you. oh wait sorry you go first yeah there just aren't a lot of people like that or, yeah. or maybe there are but most of them like you're not going to meet them in purely creative or purely business circles. Like, yeah. And so like, maybe it's just that they're harder to discover or like, it's maybe to that's it. Yeah. Um, Let me ask you, you a personal question. So personal question. What, what type is your wife? Is she like the hurricane of emotions firecracker? Is she like the very logical kind of, you know, I need to have things decided. I need to plan my <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, yeah, uh, she's uh, like, <laughs> She's very dynamic. <laughs> um, very, very dynamic. Um, yeah. And I, I, love, I love the heck out of her. But yeah, she's, she's an incredibly intense, um, very <laughs> cut and dry, not, like, not very pensive, but also incredibly sweet and, and gracious. And yeah, like she, like she embodies Jesus a lot in that way because it's like you don't uh, – I'm trying to think of the right one. I said basically like she gets, she would like gravitate more towards like heartbroken over something than she would like just being mad at you or whatever. Yeah. And so that was like something that I held very carefully over the years of like, and it was a very, that was a very physical manifestation of like how I think God feels about us too. Um, Cause it's like, he's not like, he's not angry at you. It's not like anger or disappointment. It's like, when you know somebody's like gone astray and your deepest desire is like for them to know the truth and like it hurts you that they yes. don't. I feel yeah. like that is a much more accurate representation um, of like the way the Lord feels about us. And so, yeah, yeah that's kind of, that's kind of her, her spiel. <laughs> it, it's like, it's like a wonderful thing when you learn some of the qualities about the way God loves, like through your partner, you know? Mm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's just a great thing. So yeah, that's like real sure. love right there. That's true love. Yeah. Melinda yeah. loves what to see like partners that love each other. And I think everyone does. Mm -hmm. Um, but B Melinda always makes a point to, to point it out like that man really loves his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I think yeah. it's, I didn't grow up in any kind of like uh Christian culture or anything. So I didn't see a lot of examples of, Mm -hmm. um, strong relationships like that. So I think you mm -hmm. now, even like well into my adulthood, I'm still like, Hey, look, it's happening over there. It's <laughs> happening. You know? yep. 
<laughs> so, but anyway. Yep. And that goes back to the greater conversation of like that we were having earlier, right? Because like if you never, if you never see that out in the world, like from yeah. other believers, then like, what's to attract you to Christianity? Like if there, right. nobody else is acting like Jesus, then like, what is the point? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Like it's either transformative or it's not. If it's yep. just another religion, then whatever. Like right. no offense to people who are like super invested no, in their religions, I, but right. there's a difference. There's a difference. I wouldn't want to like do. I wouldn't want to do it either if it was just another yeah. religion. You know, like yeah, I like really you're just don't. Boxes and... Right. I don't need to be in a club. I'm very busy. You know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. like, if we're talking like real, like Jesus, then yeah, that's yeah. something I desire. Yeah, that's another thing Jesus charges us with. That I think sometimes gets put on a, a, a priority level below other things. But I mean, Jesus says to his disciples, they will know that you are my followers, my disciples, by the way you love each other. Um, and, and so it, it, like that is, that's paramount for us too. Like we have to do that. That's one of, you know, the purposes of our lives. And I, I think you see sometimes, y- you know, you know, a tree by its fruit, the fruit of a lot of actions and words is, is not love it's shame and it's fear and it's all sorts of bad things so uh, like that's an that's another thing i think like you you talked about how the great commission like that should be you know something people think about and prioritize and 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 this is another one of those things that i think people forget about sometimes like regardless of what somebody believes like the fruit of the tree should be love like Mm -hmm. you should treat them with love because that's what jesus did and that's what jesus charges us to do yeah and well, funny fine. how that works too like i would i would stand to like wager that melinda probably finds other aspects of god's love in you um not only through like compassion but like assuming that assuming that she's more like grace and you're more like me right so because there's also truth in love right and like and that's hard and like we suck at balancing balancing that aspect of it right where it's yeah. not just like this like happy emotive everything's all aces all the time yeah because like that's counterfeit too like there has to be there has to be it's not that there has to be both because and i i kind of separated that from a, for a long time like i would separate like the justice of god and like integrity and whatever you want to call it even wrath like from like this love and this grace and this compassion and like you realize like god is not stuck between two poles of mm. like well i'm either love or i'm anger like it's all it's all in one um it's all in one thing so i think that's cool too and that's like a fun opportunity that we have in life i think that's one of the reasons he chose marriage as like well, you really think about God sitting down and thinking about, like, what is the thing in this world that I want to represent my love for the church? And he decides on marriage, of all things. Like, a couple of broken, screwed up people mm-hmm. trying to, like, stumble their way to the cross every day. Like, that's what he chooses? Really? And then <laughs> you think about the opportunity that's been given to us to, like, ground each other and balance each other towards finding the love of God, like as it's portrayed in scripture, like we have the opportunity to, to make that a tangible reality. Um, yeah. And not just something that's like in storybooks or pages. Mm. Yeah. Um, You're right. I, that's well said. There's truth in love and it's hard sometimes. And there's, yeah. there's, um, you know, it's not all picturesque and God is like yeah. that. And so relationships are like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so there's a yeah. lot of, there's a lot of stuff that we went through in marriage counseling that, that helped us. Cause I remember when we first like, we first said our this is real vulnerable. We first said our marriage counseling, and our pastor was like, "Dude, he was like, <laughs> you guys have like w- w- just whack expectations <laughs> for how marriage is gonna be." Like, we did this whole test, and he that's was awesome. like, "No, like that's not it at all. Like, you're gonna be <laughs> so surprised by how like raw and real and tough things are." Um, wow. And so, like, God did like a reframing there too. I think for us because we. And it's Gary Chapman says it really well. He's like, like marriage isn't designed to make you happy. It's designed to make you holy. And I was wow. like, Ugh. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, if that's true, then I'm in trouble because yeah. like, I've got a lot, I got a lot of things. Oh man. Um, 
that that's such a good point. And I think yeah. Um, I think going to church is like that too. I think people get that yep. messed up sometimes. They're like, well, going to church, you know, I I should I should feel great when I leave. You know, I should really like the music. I should really like the pastor. Mm-hmm. And maybe you do. And maybe those you know are auxiliary benefits. But church is not meant for you. Like church isn't yeah. so that you can feel something. It's so that you can honor God and that God is glorified. Yeah. And so that other people who haven't heard will hear, which I think is what we're missing the most because we've created services to like entertain and encourage Mm -hmm. like current believers, which is awesome. But like, that's not uh, necessarily the only thing church is supposed to be, especially not in scripture. So Mm -hmm. that's a weird, like that's just, I got all kinds of thoughts there because that's weird because you'll see people who go towards one side where it's like super deep theology. Like let's just encourage believers and like then you see other churches that are like like very seeker friendly or like let's keep it surface level so we can attract the max. And I love like how God uses that. Like he uses all of it together like in this grand orchestra and all the like, you know, not every – not everybody's playing the same instrument and that's cool because mm. it's yeah. all like it's still making music but yeah. i think i do think that there's a lot there's a lot of deeper things at play and that's why discipleship is the call like that's why jesus says like go make disciples and not go like start churches even though they're kind of the same thing but when you pull it back down to the individual level it always results in conversations like this like accessible attainable everyone feels encouraged it's not just like sitting down and listening to something or experiencing right. something for a long period of time. So right, yeah. Big fan of small groups, like small group churches, oh, yeah. or whatever Too. they call it that, um, whatever they call it, whatever their language is for it. Because I think, I think that a lot, a lot of gospel, as much if not more, gospel happens in conversations than it does in uh, like speeches. Mm. So. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's been our experience too. Mm-hmm. Is that yeah. you know some of the deepest bonds you make and some of the things that the closest you get to talking about Jesus's words and what they mean. And it is when mm-hmm. you're doing it with a few other people around a table instead of um, sitting in the mm-hmm. congregation. Yeah. yeah. Plus I, For I, sure. it, I think there are things that like you shouldn't say, um, or maybe, maybe shouldn't is the wrong phrase, but like there are things that are less helpful to say when you're standing, you know, on a platform and thousands or millions of people are hearing you yeah. as opposed to the types of things that you can communicate and the ways that you can love in a, you know, group of real Definitely. relationship people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was yep. kind of a tangent guys. I might just edit all that out. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's actually great. No, I think it's great because I think like, I actually think it's important for people who aren't Christians to understand that Christians struggle sometimes just as much with Christian things as they do. Yeah. Um, so I actually think wow. it's important because if That's not, really like if we just never talk about that and we edit that out, then like what, like how are they ever going to know that like we're just as critical of some of the ways that um, I want to be careful of how I say this. Like we're sometimes just as critical um, of the way that like Christian behavior aligns with Christ's behavior as they are. Mm. Yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> but, no, it's so like, true. But we yeah. don't want to talk about that, but we should. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We really should. Cause if not, then they just like, they're, it's going to be foolishness either way, but it's going to seem like, yeah, it's just not authentic at all. Yep. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, it, it's hard to lead somebody to truth when you can't acknowledge that, like for yourself, um, yep. like acknowledging your own flaws or um, maybe yeah, that like you're not perfect notions. or that you're not expecting yeah. someone else to be perfect or you don't expect yes. anyone who walks into a church to be perfect if they've known yeah. the Lord for a long time or they just met him today. You know, I yeah. think that's a really good point. Yeah. Or like the way that we like the way that we preach the gospel isn't always perfect. The way that we share the gospel isn't always perfect. The way that we like act as believers doesn't always line up with what Christ says. And it's like, it's not just acknowledging that and being like, okay, but I'm good. Like, I'm just going to keep doing me. There has to be transformation there. Don't get me wrong. But I think, right. Like Paul calls himself the chief of all sinners. He's not celebrating his sin. Like, he's not like, yahoo, like, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. Like he says, shall I send all the more the grace abound by no means. So it's not like this desire to not change, but the fact that he's willing to acknowledge the weight of his own actions and not just point at other people's. It's mm-hmm. like a huge 
they, they talk about like the log in the eye, the speck in the others or whatever. And like Jesus is like, how can you address the speck in somebody yeah. else's eye when you can't see the log in your own? I feel like mm-hmm. sometimes we need to just level with people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. About, about stuff. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah. Is not going to yep. make sense. So, yep. sorry, I don't want to drag on and get to your other questions. No, I, yeah. uh, I literally have been thinking to myself, like on and off throughout this conversation. I'm like, how are we ever going to top this? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> thank you, Grace, so oh, much. No, it's no this problem. It's really great. I'm definitely um, not a bashful Christian. Like, I don't care if people know um, <laughs> yeah. how I feel. It's just that most people don't ask, and that's why I did. Like, I do have worship music and stuff that I'm working on and like putting out with other people. Wow. Um, that's not under that. And, and like, there's a reason for that because, um, I'm trying to talk about concepts that are like, I want to get, I want to do the opposite of what I talked about earlier. Like I want to get as close to the line of Christianity as I can in my music and like share from my heart, um, uh, without people feeling like truth's being shoved down their throat because it leads to conversations like this a lot. Like, yeah. you don't know how many DMs I get that are like, what is this? Like, what do these lyrics mean of this song? Like, it just really wow. speaks to my heart. And I'm like, sick. Like, that, like, that means amazing. I'm doing my job. Like, that's yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. Because that's exactly what I want. Um, but yeah, it, that way it doesn't get tossed into, like, the bubble of CCM or, or, like, worship music or whatever. I can just write songs that are accessible and real and then hope that um, some of the greater truths in there, like, start to plant some seeds, you know? Yep. Yeah, that actually leads into my next question. I well, I've I've got two left, but um, and then we're gonna do a rapid fire. Is that okay with you? Like yeah, this, I'm this, fine. this, this. Okay. No, um, this is awesome. I feel like I made friends today. I got all the time in the world. So okay, great. <laughs> great yeah, we great, do. Great. I mean, yeah, this has been just so encouraging. Wow, God answered prayers here. Um, but so yeah, what what are some upcoming things? What are some goals? And you could take that as far as you want. Where do you see? Where do you want to be? Um, when you're 70 and a lot of the time in job interviews, like when people would ask me like, what are your goals? I would literally say, I want to do the will of God. And they're like, well, you have to define that. And I was like, nope. So like, I understand also yeah. if you want to keep it super general, um, yeah. what, what, however you feel, but what are, what are your goals? What's coming up? Yeah. So, uh, I'll start at the micro level and then go macro. So with, with, um, music, I have like, an EP coming out that's like all the rest of the live stripped versions from the album. We recorded it in a record shop right Heck before COVID. Yeah, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm waiting. So that's, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's one, I'll, I'll leak it on your channel. There's one, one of the songs is like a full band version of Good Night that's live nice. that's not in a record shop. So nice. it's kind of rock and roll actually. So I'm excited about that. Oh, man. And then right before I started my new job, I actually finished writing for the next album, which is crazy. Wow. So that's going to be cool. And um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there. I, I get I get pretty real on that about um, a lot of different things. So where I would say like ours is like the story of me falling in love with Grace and everything being kind of awesome. This album is like, a lot of the tough things that I went through after that that I never expected to go through, like in our first couple of years of marriage. So like it's pretty raw. Yeah. Like I, yeah, I'll tackle a lot of stuff. Bring it on, Gray. Oh, I'm yeah. so pumped about this. Yeah. Oh my it tackles God. like it tackles like mental health and like the clash of like, um, like how my standards like sometimes clashed against my like how I f- how I felt. I don't know how to say that. Um, but like there's some really really uh poignant lyrics kind of came out of of that so like something yeah like one example would be just like how so I like really struggled with my mental health for like most of 2019 and that was like a shock to me just like really point blank was a shock to me and so I write about just kind of processing that what that felt like um realizing that that's what was going on because I'm somebody who sometimes like stays asleep to my emotions and so like I was bearing all of the physical weight of like my mental health, just tanking my life, um, like to like gaining weight to like being angry, which isn't like an emotion I experience a lot and very, just very asleep to the fact that I was like depressed and the, wow. then, yeah, then Grace and I lived in Spain for a couple of months and my Spanish isn't very good. So I talked with Jesus a lot more and, then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm depressed. 
like and I have been for a while um, so yeah so that was like it was really actually super hard for me to write those songs but I think that's probably why I need to get them out so at the micro level that's happening at the macro level it's kind of always the same answer which is that like I just want to be faithful with the Lord and to grace and whatever that entails is awesome but with music yeah I'm excited for what's around the corner and I think this is like something I thought about I guess when I was writing it is I f there's one song that it's called Blue and it's been recorded actually for a while but it's it's kind of um it was me realizing and starting to cope with like not feeling so well and so like a big a big lyric in there is like that it's okay to be blue sometimes like basically like don't beat yourself up um just because you don't feel okay and I think that's important but I feel like in the absence of like greater truth or meaning or destiny a lot of times like most songs just end there and like most people's catalogs end there of like okay sometimes you're gonna be down sometimes you're gonna be up and there's like nothing you can do about it and so that's like the most shallow song on the record like everything else is like much deeper like how did I move past that um and yeah just a lot of realizations there so I think that's important um because I didn't want to just be like yeah I was sad for a year and then just leave it there um especially as like a professing believer I wanted to talk about um things that put me through that so th that'll be another conversation we'll have to like schedule a <laughs> a touch point when the album's out because a lot of those songs are like my other songs I feel like sometimes a little bit cryptic and and y you can capture the meaning if you've experienced that thing before and some of them like mean different things to different people but it would be nice to kind of talk about the stories behind those songs because there are very like uh there are legitimate stories behind them they're not just like kind of outer space emotions whatever and i'm sure those could be, like we know how that goes like i'm sure each of those could be its own you know conversation yeah. You know, yeah, there's a lot that goes into writing about that. something like that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I thought at one point about doing a podcast, like just like on, cause you can do that like through Spotify now, like through anchor, you can just, yeah. so I thought like at one point, should I just be dissecting these? Um, but I haven't really dedicated the time to that, which is why I respect that you guys are doing a podcast. Cause I know it's yeah. a lot. Well, but. we definitely, I had that thought. I'm like, man, like after this album is out, like we got to have you back to like talk specifics. And I know yeah. I can't wait to put this out because I'm, you know, you say you're releasing a new album. Obviously, I'm excited because I like your I like a lot of your like work that I've heard. But like especially when you start talking about what it's about and how real that is, it's like I have to hear it, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I bet a lot of people feel that way. Like even if someone listening to this has never heard your songs, like it's so authentic and it's so mm -hmm. relatable that it's like I got to listen to this and so <laughs> that's that's part of the reason why I we really wanted to do this podcast is for exactly this for people to like just have an opportunity to to tell what's really going on and what's up so yeah. that's awesome I can't wait yeah I can't that's wait awesome. for that either and it, it is it is relatable like though like Melinda tapped me on the leg when <laughs> you said I feel like I'm kind of the person that's kind of asleep to my emotions sometimes <laughs> because I have that problem too. You know, no, like I <laughs> haven't really thought about my emotions in my entire life until I started hanging out with Melinda and she asked me yeah. like deep questions about them and I didn't even know how to categorize them or what they look like or mm -hmm. anything like that. So yeah, that, that is relatable. Man, it's pretty yeah. cool how much we relate to <laughs> your story. It's pretty neat. That's awesome. Oh, that's what I love about that song, Good Night, too. Like, as soon as I heard it, I knew what it was about because that happened to me. Like, I, yeah. I used to walk Melinda home every night, and I would be, w like, we wouldn't even hug. It was like you could feel the tension <laughs> in the air, and I would just say, like, okay, have a nice night. See you tomorrow. <laughs> and then I would walk home, you know, alone at 3 a.m., and, I like, I didn't want to do that anymore, yeah. you know? Like, oh, man, that one hit. That one hit hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was um yeah, that was really big for us and yeah, Grace and I were like we dated for 3 years. Like we dated for 3 years and like we're engaged for the last of those before before we got married and so yeah, there's definitely it was really funny when I would play that song at Christian college because some of the people were like woo woo like thinking they know what the song's about and I'm like no, like it's so much more than that. Like it's this deep feeling of like you know you're supposed to be with that person and then but like we lived our lives separate until we didn't anymore. And yeah. like that is a crazy 
that's a crazy thing to feel, but I actually experienced, like, I actually think that's a good thing. I was someone who, like, wasted a lot of what could have been very positive growth moments for me in my season of engagement, and then, like, process them afterwards but I think that even that emotion of I'm like man I think it's hard like waiting to be married to grace like how do you think Jesus feels like he died on a cross and like ascended and like yeah the Holy Spirit's here but he's waiting to come get us all yeah and wow. and like scripture says that like only the like not even the son knows the day or the hour but only the father so don't you think Jesus is tapping God on the leg like I'm ready like I want to go get them yeah and the father's just like wait you gotta wait a little longer um, yeah. so that more people can hear. It's crazy. So yeah, yeah, that song, there's a lot there. <laughs> I love, wow. I, I love that song, like not in like a facetious or like prideful way, but just because it was cool to capture something that like so many of us have felt. Before so. we jump in to the next portion of our talk, we're going to take a moment and tell you how to find Trevor and I. My co-host here is named Melinda May, and you can find her music by searching Melinda May, May like the month, on the platform where you stream music. And this is Trevor Knight, Knight with a K, and we are both on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, Tidal, wherever you listen to music, you can find me and Trevor. And you can also reach out to us directly on social media, which we love to see. You can find us collectively at Stronger Voices Podcast on Instagram. And then follow us individually. I am Melinda May Music. And I am at Trevor J. Knight. Thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy the next portion of our talk. So. Are you ready? <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> it's just 10, a little more than 10 rapid fire uh questions it's just gonna be this or this this or this and you have to go with the first thing that comes to your mind it might be easy might be hard i don't know um and then like the last three are gonna be like a little more open-ended or last four or something like that so here we go um rapid fire chocolate or vanilla chocolate uh summer or winter (laughs) summer (laughs) <laughs> Mountains or beach? You guys are killing me. <laughs> oh man! Uh, you better pace yourself. Beach. There's a few. <laughs> you said no, beach. No, it's because yeah, it's because I'm not. Uh, I'm not like a hiker polar- person. I'm not this polarized. No, because I love like oh, I love everything. everything you've said so far. Like the okay. answer is both to all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so wait, mountains or beach? Do we land on beach? We land on beach for sure. Okay. Root beer or orange soda? Oh, root beer. That one's easy. Okay. (laughs) Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? It's fine, but I don't do it. Okay. That's fair. Sunset or sunrise? Sunset. Uh, Stay in or go out? (laughs) Right now, stay in because, you know, COVID (laughs) everyone. (laughs) But normally it would be go out. Yeah. Um, Action, drama, or romantic comedy? Uh, Action. Dogs or cats? Dogs. <laughs> Spotify or Apple Music? Spotify. <laughs> God. <laughs> what are you watching right now? You Show, guys. movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> You're like, I'm watching you guys. Yeah. Well, okay. I just started watching Clarice, I think is what it's called. But it's oh, like, that's too scary for me. Oh, it's really good. So I've been watching that. Um, I guilty pleasure. I did. I've made my way through most of The Walking Dead. Um, <laughs> I what else? I haven't watched a ton of TV lately. I've been like like a little monk. Like I wasn't on social media. I wasn't really watching TV very much. <laughs> I yeah. I, I take like intentional times to like make sure I'm okay now, which good. is good. that's good. Thank that's God. Good. Yes, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there's other shows I'm watching them and I can't think of them. My wife makes me watch like Grey's Anatomy, The Good Doctor, uh, New Amsterdam, like all of the medical shows. Do you um, watch any sports? I do sometimes watch sports. Um, I mostly would watch basketball. We're, we're starting to play tennis. And by starting, I mean like we bought rackets and then played every day last week. So I think we might start watching some tennis. Oh, nice. That's so fun. Yeah, there's like tennis. Y'all come visit. There's like some tennis courts in our neighborhood. Um, so we've we've done that. So if y'all ever swing through North Carolina, then come on. We'll Definitely. 
Trevor went to tennis camp like a lot you know, in his. I wasn't youth. good at tennis. It was like <laughs> I was a little kid. It was like community ed, like at the high school yeah. kind of thing yeah. for little kids. But totally. I did go to tennis camp in the summers. Yes. Um, last book you read? Last book I read. Or um, what you're reading now? Yeah, I'm reading a book called The Power of Zero, which is a book about finance. Oh. oh. Um, so you should check it out. I think actually the guy who wrote it's name is Trevor. Wait. Yeah. No, I don't know. I think, but I think, wow. yeah, it's a good book. It is a good book. And then I read, I've read like a lot of businessy books recently. I've read a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, like analyzes a bunch of corporations, a lot of business books. I've read some Daniel Pink stuff, um, like Drive is a really good book about motivation. Mm. I've read a book called Mindset um, by Carol Dweck, which is about um, like whether you have a growth mindset or a static mindset and how that affects the way that you're going to live basically. Um, mm. And then I read the Bible a lot. <laughs> Love nice. that. Um, big Bible guy. It's a do great you book. read the Bible <laughs> by book or by like topic or do you just open it or? Yeah. I all, mean, all, three. Of the, all of the above. Yeah. Gotcha. I've been going through, I'm going through like the Johns right now, like mm-hmm. first, second and third. Um, yeah. But so sometimes it's, I'll just read something that I haven't read in a while. I used to like read the Bible cover to cover like just about every year. And that was great um, for helping me kind of grasp things at a high level, but I like to go back. So like I, I've been studying my way through the new Testament for like the last several years. And I'll just like yeah. take several months and be like, I'm going to study Romans and just like, I'm somebody who writes like some people are like, it's so irreverent to write in your Bible. I write all over mine. Like I've got mm-hmm. just giant notes on everything. So yeah, I'm working my way through the Johns. So, How about ow. your favorite movie ever? Ooh, safe haven really i've never seen it i've never seen it either now we watch gotta watch it, it. No, we're gonna watch it we're gonna <laughs> watch it's on it. netflix it's one of the netflix's most popular right now um oh i think it's i think it's genuinely one of my favorite and fun fact we my my wife's grandparents have a beach house and two doors down from their beach house is the house that nicholas spark lived in and wrote most of his books in oh my gosh oh, wow. so, and the outer yeah. banks there I'm guessing. Yeah, it's right? actually, actually, uh, yeah, it's at Atlantic Beach, um, in North, nice. but yeah, North Carolina. So it is, cool. I think, technically in the Southern Outer Banks. And then Trevor has the last question of the interview for you right here. All right. So in the cover art for hours, I yeah. think it says hours on the TV. What does the uh-huh. board, the little message board say on the wall next to the TV? There's all these little words on it. Yeah. I think it says, um, I think that it says time tells the story of two hearts. Which is like Ooh. the second to last lyric of Good Night. I was Let just going to say, y- y- there's like a voiceover that says that near the end of Good Night. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me look. I'm pulling up the album art. It's right always now. been too small for, for me to like actually read it. And we've yeah. like, we always get really into cover art because when we make our own, it takes us so much longer than we think it's going to. And there's so many little things that go into it. And so yeah. I knew that whatever was on that was probably put there intentionally. Yep. Yeah, it says time tells the story of two hearts. So you got the gist of that, of the album cover, right? Like, what do you think it is? I don't know what it is. I mean, it it like, it, it looks like a living room. Where your home is. Where your like, home is, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was. So they're, like, one of the objects, like, all of the objects that are in the view of the camera, there's, mm-hmm. like, an object that represents each song. <gasps> Whoa. Wow. That's so um, cool. Yeah, let me tell you what they are. I have it written down somewhere. This is so um, juicy. <laughs> so the um the lamp in the back is a good night. The the little guitar um is for October cuz that, that that just had like a bunch of significance, but first time I ever played out that was the song oh I played. Uh lamp's good night. October is the guitar. Love we have is the phone with texts like it's got texts open. Oh, oh no. my gosh! Yeah. Then parchment. Um, so the, on the left, like there's a stack of books. I used to write Grace a letter every single day um, for the whole time we dated. So I have like three years of letters of the time they got married. So that's what parchment's about. Um, is like, yeah, that's what that's about. So that's every journal from all the letters I wrote her. And then c- grown is the plant, which is corny as all heck. Um, <laughs> for hours, it's the clock behind the journals 
Um, mm -hmm. And then wow. the sun shines peeking through the windows. Like it's saturated over by the windows. Um, the quicksand um, reprises the metronome. Quicksand is the hourglass next to the TV. Swoon is the TV itself because that's the TV I use on the album cover for it. Um, oh, nice. And then to the left of the metronome in the window is a jar of sea glass. Um, so that's glass. It's like a jar of sea glass and shells. And then um, look up is, I may have revised. Um, look up is supposed to be, oh, look up's the mirror, I think, pointed at the ceiling. Yeah, I was going to suggest, yeah, I was going to guess that. It's got to be That's that. awesome. Yeah. And then Good Night kind of has to because the time tells the story of two hearts is a lyric from it as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. so it just was supposed to be a bunch of objects that would kind of, um, that were significant to me, I guess. So. Man, I can't, I can't like believe that we get to have that wow. explanation on our podcast. That's so cool. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, nobody else knows this. Nobody else yeah. knows that. So it's That's like awesome. Exclusively you guys know that. I knew, <laughs> I knew there was a story to this. Just because like yeah. when you listen to your music and everything's so artful and then you have this Polaroid photo that is of a room I, and you can tell there's text on the board and everything. I just knew this was an intentional photo and mm -hmm. I really wanted to know what it was about. That's so awesome. So thank you. That's cool. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, the B-Sides cover is pretty cool too. That's, well, it's, it's already out because of the... um of like the singles that are out but that's like oh it's printed it's like the, the album yeah. never printed on a on a eight track cassette tape yeah um, yeah so because i think it's going to be an i think that's an like a seven or eight track ep mm -hmm. so that was wow. my friend actually had that idea one of the guys who drummed on the album was like you should oh, do that's an eight really track cool. oh my gosh so, that's awesome I yeah see. it's really cool Isn't that fun? that's cool wow so yeah, so I'd, uh, yeah so then the canvas for that hopefully is going to be like a cassette going into an eight track player when is this new album going to be out or do you not know yet on, so well, i just got back one of the masters i'll text it to you guys um i just got back the master for good night please don't release this <laughs> <laughs> we I just definitely got back. will not this is just i like just trust you guys so i'm gonna send this to you so i'm waiting on a couple more there's a lot of ducks to get in a row. It's oh, yeah. understandable. But for sure this year, you'd say, yeah? Or maybe early next year? Oh, yeah. It'll be this year for sure. For sure. For sure. Cool. It'll probably That's... be, if I'm guessing, it'll be maybe like June-ish yep. at this point. Oh, wow. Um, That's pretty soon. Yeah. Who do you guys use to master, by the way? Um, like the last few. Um, so, so Melinda's been going to the same studio in Pennsylvania for like 11 years or mm -hmm. something where she grew up. Um, and so we, we fortunately have a great relationship there where we just kind of go in and, uh, you know, we have our ideas, but the, the recording and the mixing is all kind of done there, um, as we think of ideas. So we're, we're not really pressed for time in there, which is always great. Um, and then recently yeah. we've been sending the final mixes over to a couple different people at Sterling Sound. I don't know if you've ever yeah. heard of them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so like. I was fortunate that um, one of the guys who produced my first song had had a song mastered by somebody there, so he, like, referred me to them. So, like, uh, like Chris Gehringer masters a lot of my songs. Um, Randy Merrill masters a lot of Melinda's songs. Mm -hmm. So they Randy Merrill did, like, Taylor Swift's album. Chris. Yeah. Um, and then wow. Chris Gehringer does a lot of pop. He does, like, Lady Gaga stuff and Rihanna stuff. Nice. And yeah. Yeah, mastering is a lot cheaper than mixing. Like, it's a yeah. lot... The, the mastering community, it's a lot easier to get stuff mm -hmm. out to, like, different people that you would want to because the price points yeah. are more affordable. Whereas, mm -hmm. like, mixing, like, producing and mixing are just so crazy. But, like, yeah. I just remember talking to my buddy who's, like, really made it as a producer and saying, like, bro, like, maybe we should do one of my songs together sometime and, like 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 what do you charge and he's like well it just depends on the budget like sometimes it's x sometimes it's y and he was like i like the last song i did was like as a single and the budget for the song was like 30k like just for what? the for the production like mixing and mastering wow and I'm like whoa so yeah, yeah i've i think i've managed to find the balance of having like a tight community of people that i really really trust that master and mix a lot of stuff i like but i don't have to like sell a kidney to put a song yeah. out Yep. Thank God. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Your song just came through on our text chat. I 
cannot I can't wait, wait to, to listen it. to it. Yeah. I, yeah. I love both you versions of that song. I love yeah. it. So This has been so good, Gray. Like, thank you so, so much. This is like sure. such an answer to prayer. So definitely, many prayers. Definitely. And like, there's so much, there's so much in this talk, like from yeah. like what your new album is going to be about and to kind of um, just so much that can be applied, not just to mm-hmm. music, but to life. Well, yeah, all definitely. of it can be applied to life. So thank you so much. This was so good. For sure. Yeah, y'all are going to have to trim it down a good bit, I know. So sorry, <laughs> I know your work's cut out for you on that. Not but, um, not too much. I, I'm going to keep a lot yeah. in. It's going to be a long one. I think that's okay because there was just so much in here that mm-hmm. I know t- just to me personally, it was like very encouraging to hear. So I know that definitely. other people are going to experience that too. That's so. awesome. But if well, you guys are it's so good to meet you guys. And yeah. If you guys are ever in New York, um, we have room here. You've got a place That's to awesome. stay. Same to you guys. I mean, we're next to an international mm-hmm. airport. So <laughs> if you're ever passing through Raleigh, you guys want to do do a little write session or whatever, then just hit me up. I have, have literally number. always wanted to go to the Raleigh-Durham Chapel Hill Triangle. I just always, always have wanted to go there. I like figured out yeah. when I, w- when I was moving, like trying to move away from my small town in Pennsylvania, it was like on my radar and I've just mm-hmm. never checked it out. So we'll have to do that. Well, come check it out. Yeah. End up really liking it. It's, it's a cool area for sure. It's for sure a cool area. Yeah. So we'll show you around. I had the yeah. best cheeseburger of my life like two weekends ago. From where? In a place here in Chapel Hill. It's, uh, oh, it's called Al's Burger Shack. Yeah. Wow. And it, they again, it won some awards or whatever, apparently. I'm gluten-free, not by choice. And they had, like, Same. a gluten-free bun that was unreal. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Unreal. As soon as so. you started talking about the Whole30, I'm like, he's gluten-free. I just know it because people yeah. who do the Whole30, because I'm gluten-free, and typically yeah. people who do the Whole30, it's not just because I'm like, I got a crazy idea. It's usually because it's like, why am I sick? You know, I'm, like, trying to figure out how yes. to get healthy. Yeah. Huge, right. yeah, huge journeys there for sure. It's tough. It's tough to figure out. And yeah, that's where like foreign countries actually kind of have the drop on us with their food oh, supplies yeah. and stuff. Just a lot oh, yeah. cleaner. Mm-hmm. Um, so like when I, tra- like I used to travel internationally a lot, Grace and I both did like once we were married and oh, like the, just the whole foods that are there are so, I've heard that people can eat gluten there like when they can't hear. I didn't, wow. I haven't tried that because yep. I haven't had the time to be sick. <laughs> if it doesn't go don't according to the plan. Yeah, exactly, yeah. because it's like... Melinda it, has said the exact same thing. People are like, I don't well, have time to have a stomach ache for four days. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So, yep. And that's all I can do is like lay there. So, mm-hmm. But I'm coming to Raleigh. I'm going to Al's Burger Shack. I'm getting a gluten-free bun. It, and definitely. it's going to be I will great. go with you guys. I really will. <laughs> okay, great. It's going to happen. That's awesome. That's awesome. Great, thank, well, thank you, you guys so, for so your time. much. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm so glad you agreed to be on. Thank you so much. Huge blessing. Yeah, just keep me updated. Um, keep in we touch. Will. Don't be strangers. Yep. Okay, you too. Thanks, Gray. Right. Bye. See Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with Gray. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. You can listen to Gray's music by searching all lowercase G-R-A-Y on the music platform of your choice. And his most recent album, which I love, is called Ours. Follow Gray on Instagram. Type in Music of Gray. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we'll see you next time.